Good morning, Oaks family, and welcome to 10 plus 10 at 10. Actually, it's not 10 plus 10 at 10, is it? It's more like 30 plus zero at 10, but we're going to continue our little journey through the scriptures and just uh, teaching uh, and listening to the Holy Spirit as we work our way through a chapter a day through the New Testament. Praise God for his word. Amen. And uh, Wow, it's Monday, another week, looking forward to hunkering. Are you getting hunker fatigue? Huh. I have hunker fatigue. And I want to say praise God for East Peoria. I don't know if you follow them or not, but I saw an interview the other night, and Mayor Artis, and I think his name is Call, Mayor Call of East Peoria. I like that guy. <laughs> I'm telling you, he... There, I just got a phone call. Uh, he, he is... And he's, he's, they got a plan together to reopen East Peoria. And I guess he's went about as far as he can go, keeping, letting his people and families, uh, just financial uh, lives just collapse. And so they're, they're working towards opening it up safely. And pray that more will do that. Pray that we get our government and Governor Pritzker uh, in line with what would be wise way forward before the whole thing collapses, right? Uh, anyway, that's a little bit political, but that's kind of what I'm thinking. Read a little thing about New Zealand and some other countries and how they did it right, and they locked everybody down. I thought, who wants to be New Zealand? What have they ever done? I mean, seriously, maybe somebody out there from New Zealand, I don't know, but I'm like, come on, we're, we're the United States of America. Uh, we're, we're, we're different and, uh, we've got to, we, we do, we're different. I don't, uh, so anyway, wow, well, well, anyway, more politics, right? Uh, I don't want to be New Zealand. Uh, I want to be America. We're pioneers, man. We are, uh, we're out there. We're entrepreneurs, all those things. So anyway, yeah, let's go for it. Come on. Let's get our government on board so we can get going, right? So, uh, and we want, we have to obey what the word says about obeying our leaders. So we will do that, but praying to God that he will show us a way forward at the Oaks Community Church and how we can uh, reopen. Speaking of that, Tuesday night, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, pray for us as our leadership board of elders meets and we talk about these things, about going forward. Uh, but anyway, did I welcome you all? Welcome all of you, wherever you're at. Uh, God bless you all. Glad you're with us this morning. I have a a, a happy thought, and uh, it came, uh, just came, really, not very long ago. I had a couple other things, but this this supersedes it. And the other night I talked about the crack pot, remember? And this crack pot, it's, it is all, it broke into hundreds of pieces. And we got this out at Crow Creek Indian Reservation and uh, as a gift and broke it. And our little difficulty putting it all back together uh, was just symbolic of who we are as crackpot people. Anyway, I have no memory of this whatsoever, but Peggy Johnston sent me this picture. And... Uh, this is that crew. This is the crackpot crew here. And apparently I wrote an article about it in the paper. I don't know what paper this is. Uh, and anyway, you can't read it anyway. But uh, it, it's an article about our cracked, cracked pots is the title there. And there's the group of us that went out there. Uh, from Victoria and Maxie Chapel. And I think, I don't know if there was some, maybe some Galva people with us also. Uh, anyway, I want to show you one more picture. It just really, really thrilled me to see it. And uh, thank you, Peggy, for that, for uh, bringing that, uh, sending that to me. And anyway, I looked at some of the, oh, wow, this goes back quite a ways and I reckon you know so the picture's not that great you can't see it really well but I recognize Bill Pettifer right there and there's Larry Piper I recognize him and uh there I'm right there uh there's Megan Sorenberger there's uh 
uh, Roger Miller, I think, right there. Over here, Peggy, Peggy Johnston. And anyway, that was, that was our cracked pot crew uh, that went to Crow Creek Indian Reservation, served the Lord there. Uh, trip to remember, uh, mainly because of the cracked pot, right? And so something that looked like a disaster, and uh, I don't know who dropped that pot. I don't, why do I keep thinking of Linda Burris? I'm not sure why, but anyway, uh, I don't know if Linda, I don't know. If Linda had anything to do with that or not, she'll have to tell me uh, here sometime uh, in the future. Anyway, that's kind of a happy thought. Praise God. And hope you have some happy memories of ways you've went out and served uh, others in the name of Jesus. And those little uh, short-term mission trips are just really uh, a blessing. Uh, so I'm just, I've just been blessed to be on a number of them. Unfortunately, as you know, we had to cancel our one to uh, Patterson, uh, New York. And so uh, that's a heartbreak. Uh, but we are praying to be able to go uh, next year uh, after the pandemic kind of uh, lessons. Okay, right. Let's get to Romans 10. I don't think I'll be a long time on this chapter. It's short. and uh, But... You know, we'll just see how the Lord leads us. And the number one thing, speaking of the Lord leading us, is His Holy Spirit uh, filling us and being our main teacher. So let's pray about that before we get started. Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, pray and ask that you would guide our study this morning of Romans 10. We thank you so much for this uh, letter from Paul and uh, this part of it today. Uh, we're praying and asking, Holy Spirit, you fill us, uh, be my, fill me, so that you can speak through me too, Lord, uh, but fill all of us so that you are our main teacher as we work through your inspired, God-breathed word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. We're in a section here uh, that's uh, very, very interesting. Uh, for Paul, it's, uh, yes, it's part of his systematic theology, but it's kind of uh, a 9, 10, and 11 are, are uh, I don't know what to call it, other than it's just a plea uh, for the Jewish people, his people. And it started there in 9, where we hear him saying, I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, I wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren. What, what a peace there that Paul has. You know, just his, his evangelistic heart for his very people. And you know, kind of that's something that we think about. My gosh, Lord, don't... I could go and save the whole world, but... What about my, my family, those closest to me? Don't go to China and try to save China till you've done your part right at home in your own family. And Paul struggles with that. Over and over, the Gentiles coming to Christ in masses, but yet his own people missing it. His heart breaks for that. That speaks, I hope that speaks to all of us. Uh, you know, I can preach and teach to everybody but my heart for my own immediate family never goes away I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through it so nine there he kind of uh, talks about that and how special and selected and chosen the the jewish people are there in nine and now we get to ten and in, in 9, by the way, speaking of that, as he speaks about the Jews, uh, he quotes the Old Testament 10 times. 10 times. Again, I know I'm a broken record on this, but knowledge of the Old Testament and awareness of the story and the journey of the Jewish people uh, is essential for us to truly enter into the deepest levels of love and appreciation for our great God and for his 
longing for his people to know him, to be in a righteous relationship with him as we have been kind of fleshing out here in a right relationship with him. Uh, but it's through faith in Jesus Christ, and that's what Paul is trying to get through uh, to them. So he works through there with, with 10 Old Testament quotes in chapter 9. Now we get to chapter 11, and guess what? It's a short chapter, but there are 11 Old Testament quotes in chapter 10. 11 of them. Again, knowing and understanding the Old Testament is so foundational and fundamental for us. And then in uh, chapter 11 is going to be more of this, talking more still about Israel. And he's got uh, seven Old Testament quotes in chapter 11. So in the scope of three chapters here, we have 28 Old Testament quotes. So just saying, uh, just saying, uh, what a love he has for his people. What a what a work he has done going back, as, uh, going back and pulling his knowledge of the Old Testament, pulling his understanding of what God has done forward now into the, the new era and the new covenant of Jesus Christ. He is a master, an inspired master at putting this uh, together. And I won't even come close to doing it justice. You know that already. I've made that clear. Uh, but here in 10, we really see the heart of an evangelist. Uh, Paul's heart is an evangelist. And for us, it's a chapter for us to reflect on our heart as evangelists, as those who are bearers of the good news of Jesus Christ, the euangelion uh, uh, of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go for it. Brethren and brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, and he's talking about the, the Jew, Jewish people, is for their salvation. His heart's desire, his prayer, this is in his heart. It never goes away no matter how much success he has as a Gentile evangelist, uh, his heart breaks and his prayers rise day by day uh, for his own people, the Jewish people. That brings me to the first question here right out the gate. Who is your heart broken for? Who do you pray for every day? to come to salvation through Jesus Christ. If your answer is no one, then you don't have the heart of an evangelist to begin with. But everyone should have a heart of evangelist. So maybe there's a good place to start with prayer. And who are those people? And it really should be, with Paul's uh, example, those closest to us who do not know Christ as Savior, who are not saved who have not experienced his salvation. Think about that. I hope that you get some of those, some names on your prayer list, on your prayer uh, altar that you lift every, actually, my immediate family's not on my prayer altar. They're just right here in my heart. I don't need to, I actually don't even need to remember them uh, on a little, on a three by five card or a, or a post-it. They're just right here. And they come up every day, every morning. Uh, my prayers, and I think, like I have told many of you, there's 60-some of them in my family. Some of them know Jesus, some of them don't. I just pray for all of them. Verse 2. For I testify about them, they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. And that's a fascinating, they're, they're zealous. I mean, they, they've got so many rules and regulations uh, they really got a zeal, all right, and they just keep making them up. Uh, but, but Paul is just saying it, it won't work. It's not in accordance with the knowledge that has been revealed now through Jesus Christ, right? Sincere religion, he is saying, will not cut it. And I grew up in a church like that, in a Methodist church like that, that had um, lots of 
methodology and things that you do and go through and was liturgical and all that and we would read this stuff uh, every week and a responsive reading and this and that and back and forth and people and I was just lovely people but just going through uh, religious motion trying to earn their way and it won't work Paul says you can be zealous for that and obey all whatever it is 613 laws or whatever it is they made up but it, it, it doesn't work you because you can't obey them all right and so zeal uh, in the wrong, pro, improperly focused, it won't, it won't do it. It won't, it won't lead to salvation. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. See, they haven't, and that's what Paul's trying to teach them. Righteousness, being in a right relationship with God. Paul has taught us over and over, and I'll repeat it again. You can't do it by obeying the law. And Paul is teaching that's not even the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to teach you that you can't be righteous by obeying it because you'll just continue to break it. No matter if you do 600 of them right, you'll, you'll break one. And you, the same as break them all, right? That's what James says. So they don't know... Uh, they don't subject themselves to the righteousness of God. In other words, they don't, they, they don't receive and, and uh, subject themselves, fall, uh, bow, humbly bow before God and say, okay, I can't make it. I can't do this. I'm going to put my trust in Jesus Christ. And I don't know why that seems too easy for them or after they've worked so hard and for now to realize, you know what, I can't do it. I just have to repent put my faith in Jesus. And Paul says, they just don't get it. They won't get it. Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Amen? That's us. I hope, I hope it's you. He's the end of the law for righteousness because you can't get in a right relationship with him through the law. And the, the, the way the law has led us to the point now of believing, of transferring our trust to Jesus Christ. He is the only way to be righteous. Verse 5, Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. That's Leviticus 18, 5. But Moses writes it and knows to the people that he's speaking it to, they can't do it. He has seen that repeated. How many times does Moses say to God, these people are hard-headed. And Moses himself knows that he's not even going to get to go into the promised land. Because, why? Because he didn't obey God, flaunted his kind of power. I don't know if it was arrogance or what it was. But Moses knows. Everybody knows. We know. Verse 6. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. The righteousness is based on faith, a transfer of trust to Jesus Christ. It speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. I have a lot of trouble with these verses. I'm not going to help you much on these uh, I prayed about them a lot, but what does it mean? I'm going to, like, it's some sort of, I'm ascending to heaven somehow through my righteousness. Uh, but the righteousness based on faith says, stop, you can't do that. You're not going to make it, okay? Maybe that's what it says. Maybe that's the interpretation, okay? Uh, this is Deuteronomy 30, by the way. And by the way, Deuteronomy, my favorite, probably my favorite Old Testament book. I love that book. And maybe talk about it a little bit more here in a minute. Verse 7. Who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. So it's not trying to ascend. It's not... I don't know what that one means. Descending, it's not pulling. It's not. It's not pulling Christ up or down, uh, but it's uh, simply uh, in your heart, in your mouth, in your heart. You don't have to go searching for it, high or low. It's right here. 
It's right here. It's in your heart. And I pray and trust that it is in uh, your heart. Let's go back uh, to Deuteronomy, though, because I really want to mention this just a little bit here. Deuteronomy 30, because that's what he's quoting here. And, uh, but Deuteronomy 30, and, and, and all the Old Testament is about this, any, by the way. The Old Testament is about grace. Uh, it's God's riches at Christ's expense all the way through. Again, like I said before, Christ's uh, death and resurrection goes all the way back to the beginning, and it goes all the way forward into eternity. Uh, so it's God's riches at Christ's ex expense all the way through. Okay? But what I love about Deuteronomy is, is it, it is about love. And chapter 30 is, is a beautiful one. In verse 2, uh, Return to the Lord your God, obey Him with all your heart and your soul. Again, obedience based on your heart and your soul. Not obedience like I'm trying to earn something, but it's an expression of my heart and my soul and my love for God. That's what true obedience to the law is. It's on the back side of repentance and faith, not on the front side, okay? And he mentions heart again, Moses does in verse 6. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Again, it's not obedience. The love goes first. The love in our heart goes first. Again, verse 10. If you obey the Lord to keep his commandments, his statutes, which are written in the book of the law, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul... Again, this is where obedience comes from. This is what they missed or were missing. Verse 14, the word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart, that you observe it. That's where obedience comes from, in our hearts. He's not nearly done. Getting into verse 15 has this beautiful section about choosing life. I set before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. Obedience brings life. But if your heart, it's from your heart, choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, uh, with your heart. And that's what, what makes Deuteronomy so beautiful. That's why Paul's using it here. Uh, obedience comes from the heart. Verse 9, that if, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. I love the word confess here. You all know that. Some of you have been around my preaching for a long time. Here it's the word homologeo. And homo is where we get our, it's one. Uh, same. The same. And like from homosexual, it's an attraction for the same sex. Homo. Logeo. Uh, to speak. To speak word, the word to speak words. So the same to speak. What I really love the word confession is when it's ex homologeo, which it is a number of times also in Scripture, which is the word out exit. And so there we have three words. Uh, we have exit, homo, the same, logeo, the word, and that's most to me is most uh, instructive. Uh, but it's our word confession. And it's the word to speak out the same that is in me. That's confession. In other words, it's coming from my heart, the depths of my being. And Paul is saying here, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus says, Lord. He's not talking about that you're just speaking words because somebody told you to speak it. He's talking about a confession, a word, Jesus Christ is Lord, coming out of the depths of my being, out of my heart. And so that means that it's the real deal, that it's really happened. My heart has been changed and circumcised. And I speak, uh, I speak this word here. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. It's not just three words. It's out of the depths of my being. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is Lord. 
you believe it in your heart that God raised him from the dead and here he has the resurrection because the resurrection proves that Jesus truly is uh, the Savior who died for our sins, who shed his blood for our sins, who has the power to cleanse us from our sins. How do we know that? Because he's raised from the dead. Anybody can claim that. But Jesus was raised from the dead, proving that he truly is the victor. This is beautiful, isn't it? Confess with your mouth. Believe with your heart. You'll be saved. This is not hard theology, you guys. This is just simple, basic. It's not some deep, profound, theological uh, thing. Some sort of, I don't know, pre-existential, midlife crisis, post-toasty theology. It's just, it's just confess and believe. Confess with your heart. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. That's it. Don't add anything else to it, ever. That's what Paul's saying. Verse 10. For with the heart, a person believes resulting in righteousness. With a heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And righteousness is a right relationship with God. The result is you are in a right relationship with God. With a mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. Now, salvation is a big word for Paul in Romans. Uh, too big probably for us to get uh, all th through it. But primarily, it's, it's deliverance. I believe it's deliverance. It's deliverance now, but ultimately, again, it's sort of like the eternal life thing. It's deliverance from the wrath that is to come, uh, the wrath that they all believe is coming. And Romans 13, 11 gives you a little bit more understanding of that. Look at what he says here in a couple chapters from now. Knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. And there you see clearly that he's speaking of a, a future uh, deliverance uh, from the wrath that is coming when Christ returns. And, it's believe, and today it's closer than it was yesterday. Our salvation continues to progress closer and closer uh, to the day of complete deliverance. I think about the EE visits I made. And... Uh, especially the ones I made with, with Rhonda, Hester, and, and Donna, uh, my sister-in-law. And, and, and a couple of them just visiting their house. I, I think of my Uncle Ralph. He was kind of this, this guy, and I loved him with all my heart, but he was treasurer of the Sheldon's Grove Church, he, and he did everything. Sundays, he was there. He was like, like did all the stuff. But his heart hadn't been changed. He was zealous for the church, uh, but it was a zeal uh, of works and laws and obedience. And that won't get you there. And we were blessed one evening to go to his house and share the gospel of, of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And that's it uh, for your salvation and for your eternal security. I remember sharing it with him that night and and he prayed with us to receive Christ. He's dead now. But he's not really dead. Because he repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's inherited his salvation. He's free, saved from the wrath to come. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Whoever believes will not be disappointed there's no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. We are all rich. Christ became poor for us so that we could become rich, uh, assured of eternity, assured of uh, just a blessed life. Uh, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, what Paul's going to do, he's really going to start racking up some Old Testament scripture here because why because he's speaking to his people and he'd have to as an evangelist now he's have to show his people that this is the way it is this is the way it's been from the beginning 
And so he's going to use some real evangelistic type scriptures now uh, to bring them to understanding. That's his prayer and his hope. Whoever will call the name of the Lord will be saved. He's going to work with some objections now because once he says that, they're all going to be saying, well, we never heard of this before. Well, verse 14, how then will they call on him whom they've not believed? How will they believe in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? This could be the, his re, the people, his family rebuttal to him, the Jews. Verse 15, how will they preach unless they're sent? Just as it is written, and now Paul will, will answer these objections. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. That's Isaiah 52. And Isaiah basically saying, uh, people, God has sent people to bring good news uh, all the way back uh, 750 years when Isaiah wrote and, and all the way back uh, farther farther and farther. There's, there's people who are bringing good news and it's beautiful and it's the same good news just like it was back in Deuteronomy. Uh, love God with, with your heart. Verse 16. However, they did not heed the good news for Isaiah says, Lord who has believed our report and that st sets up Isaiah 53 probably the most beautiful chapter in Isaiah, as he now will talk about Jesus coming. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, oh wait, Lord, let's believe our report. I just said, read that. Verse 17, so faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So somebody needs to speak the word, hearing by the word of Christ. Now, I don't remember anybody speaking the word to me, but this, this was the word to me. Uh, this works too. And faith comes by uh, hearing the, the word spoken as you read it. There's another way, but we're kind of thinking of people speaking, aren't we? Verse 18. I say, surely they've never heard, have they? Indeed they have, Paul says. And again, he's going to quote, he's going to quote Psalm 19. Their voice has come out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Verse 19, but I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? Another objection. Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. Deuteronomy 32 there. That's a way back, all the way back to where we were. That's Moses' uh, song there. And Moses is predicting there, even prophesying uh, that the, the Gentiles are going to receive uh, the Word of God going to make you all jealous because you continue to be hard-headed and you continue to reject it. Verse 20, Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. Talk about a prophecy. Uh, there, Isaiah prophesying there about the Gentiles. And this is, actually, Paul is basically saying, this is old stuff, you guys. God is prophesied through his people uh, for, what, 1,500 years uh, about the Gentiles coming to faith. And then at the end, verse 21, but as for Israel, now Paul's back to his people now. As for us, he says, all the day long, I've stretched out my hand to a disobedient and obstinate people. And that's Isaiah 65. But what that verse also says, and not to end on a bad note, it says, God never gives up. God, all the day long, keeps stretching out his hand to a disobedient and obstinate people. God never gives up on his people. You and I must never give up on our people, our family. You know, I don't know how long I've known Sam Turbeck. Uh, that's been a long time, maybe some three or four years. I don't know how long it's been. And I also could not count the number of times that Sam and I have prayed together for our brothers. For our immediate family. He has a broken heart for his family to come to Jesus, to know Jesus, to live for Jesus. And I have a broken heart for my family 
to come to know Jesus, to live for Jesus. Um, no amount of success uh, in the world can, can make the way, no amount of zeal uh, for success, whatever, can make up in the end uh, for failure to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you think about that, as you think about that for your immediate family, I hope it breaks your heart. I hope it breaks your heart and brings you to your knees in prayer for them every day. And I pray that it opens up opportunities for you to love them, for you to be a favorable and attractive witness to them. And I pray, like all of us who have that burden, and I pray that really is every single one of us have that immediate burden for our families, that one day they will come to faith in Jesus Christ. They will enter into a righteous relationship through repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. May it be. Let's pray. Father, thank you for chapter 10 today and just entering into the depths of Paul's heart for his immediate people, the Jewish people. I pray the same for all of us. A heart for those most close to us in our families. And that we do want the whole world to be saved. We thank you for every opportunity we get to evangelize and be favorable, attractive witnesses to all of them. But we pray also, first and foremost, uh, for those closest to us, that they, what were the words Paul said? That they confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that you raised Jesus from the dead as victor over all sin and death and that they will be saved. Hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Pray you have a wonderful Monday. Love you.